Saperson webinar. Uh, today we have Tim Brown and Lindsay Caldwell presenting their work um, using driver, driving simulators to look at how long it takes um, or the effects of driving after distal radius fracture. Um, so I will let Tim and Lindsay take over from here. Thanks, Jacob. So we're going to kind of divide and conquer on this presentation here. Uh, Lindsay's going to take the take the front and the back end of it and talk about the problem and, and kind of what the implications are. And I'll cover some more of the methodological issues in the middle. So I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay here to, to get us started. Hi, guys. My name is Lindsay Caldwell. I'm one of the hand and upper extremity surgeons at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. And kind of before we get into the meat of the presentation, I just want to take a minute to talk about what do we mean when we say a distal radius fracture? So when you look at your forearm, it's made up of two long bones. It's made up of the ulna, which is on the pinky side of the forearm, and it's made up of the radius, which is on the thumb side of the forearm. Down towards the wrist area, the ulna and the radius meet the small carpal bones in the wrist. The radius is that big bone that you can see on the x-ray at right. It is the largest bone uh, at, in the entire x-ray field. And because it's the biggest bone, it takes about 80% of the force through the wrist. So when you load your hand, 80% of that force is going through the distal radius. And we think that's why it's one of the most commonly fractured bones in the body. So in the images at right, it's sort of a representative distal radius fracture. And at the left, you can see clinically what that looks like when we see it um, in person. These most commonly occur after a fall on an outstretched hand, but they can occur from a multiple uh, different uh, traumatic injuries. So the problem we're looking to address uh, is when can people go back to driving after distal radius fractures? As I mentioned, they're an extremely common orthopedic injury. They affect over 640,000 people per year in the United States, and in some series they account for up to 2.5% of all ER visits in the United States, so pretty big problem. There are multiple treatment options for different distal radius fractures, including both operative and non-operative treatment options, but regardless of how you treat these, the recovery process involves a period of immobilization, activity limitation to allow for healing, and typically involves pain, stiffness, and weakness for at least a period of time. At some point during this process, we as surgeons always get asked, when can I return to driving? And the problem is we really don't have a good answer for them. There's really no standardization of answers. Survey studies have been done of physicians that show that there's little agreement regarding both the time frame or the criteria that we use as to when these people can return to driving. So breaking's time, so time to breaking, has been used to assess function and provide return to driving guidelines for lower extremity injuries but we really don't have a similar measure for the upper extremity. And even the studies that have been performed on the effect of upper extremity immobilization on driving have been performed in completely healthy subjects who have then been immobilized, which really limits their applicability to people who will have pain, stiffness, and all of these issues associated with the injury itself. So the aim of our study was to evaluate the effect of distal radius fractures on safety of roadway users, particularly drivers and passenger vehicles, and to provide valuable information both to patients and to physicians in counseling their patients on when they can return safely to driving. So again, research questions. When can these people drive safely after this common injury? And as a corollary to that, is there clinical data that we can use that can accurately predict when patients are able to drive safely after distal radius fractures? So this is a study in progress. Um, so far, as far as our participants go, we have 10 enrolled. Uh, two of these dropped out. Four of these have completed all study procedures. Uh, and four are currently in progress. We are continuing to actively enroll patients at this time. So today we're going to present uh, preliminary data from the first four subjects at their first visit to the simulator. Um, our inclusion criteria for the study were uh, an operatively treated unilateral distal radius fracture 
in a patient who was between the ages of 18 and 70 years old. They had to have no other injuries, and they had to be a licensed driver who regularly drives more than 2,000 miles per year. All these patients were identified and screened by hand and upper extremity surgeons, mostly myself, at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, and were invited to participate in the study if inclusion criteria were met. And they were evaluated by the treating surgeon prior to each study visit to ensure that they were continually eligible to be part of the study. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what our method was, and as, as Dr. Caldwell mentioned, you know, they start off with this screening visit uh, where we make sure they're they're eligible, and then at their two week, six week, and twelve week uh, post surgery follow up, we had them come into the driving simulator after they had uh, completed their visit, and then they had two main drives that they completed, uh, one of which was was a general drive, uh, trying to look at how well do they control the vehicle when there's not anything crazy going on, uh, no hazards to avoid. And then the second one is, okay, let's, lo let's look at what happens when something unexpected happens that requires the driver to have to put a steering input in uh, that is not just normal uh, lane keeping. And so here we've got a, a, a study timeline visit or study visit timeline that covers kind of everything that happened. It looks very, uh, very busy, but uh, they're in and out in about an hour. Um, you know, we start off with some driving confidence uh, data collection, uh, practice drive, uh, wellness survey, just to make sure that they're not prone to motion sickness. That is most important on the first visit that they come in, uh, and that is where we actually lost one of ours is after they complete. One of our subjects that we lost uh, was lost at that point in time. Uh, uh, they weren't feeling the best after completing that, and we uh, dropped them from the study. Uh, and then we've got a, a period of urban driving, a period of rural driving, and then an emergency response. And uh, then we asked them, we surveyed them again about their driving competence, uh, assessed their, get a workload assessment, uh, and then a self assessment of their performance. Uh, there were short breaks between each of these. Uh, items uh, that varied by participant, uh, but generally a couple minutes to, to reorient as we switch between tasks. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of, of what, we, what we use in the drive. And so um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the work we've done at NADS in the past, uh, we've got a, a drive that we developed that's kind of representative of drive home uh, that includes an urban area, an interstate area, and a rural area. For this study, we use the urban and the rural area, uh, largely because of the steering requirements associated with those portions of the drive. And so this urban drive uh, is, is a somewhat busy, uh, it's a dark environment, um, even though the state of collection was during the day, it was representing uh, nighttime driving conditions. Uh, they drove along a two-lane roadway at, with speed limits of 25 and 35 miles an hour. Uh, navigating some curves, and then most importantly, making a left turn across traffic um, at some point during the drive. There are three versions of this drive. This map that's shown represents one of the three variations that we have, or the three equivalent variations that we have, uh, where these events were shuffled around in there to provide some variability between one drive and the other. Uh, this represents the rural drive, and uh, what we see there is, again, this is one of three versions of that. Uh, they turn off of the off-ramp, uh, requiring a right-hand turn. Uh, they have to navigate a relatively tight curve, uh, navigate a Y, and then uh, pull into a driveway at the end off of a roadway. And so there's a fair amount of curve driving here, so they're making steering corrections left and right. Um, and again, this tightening radius curve here is probably the most challenging part of it, uh, requiring them to continually add steering input as they complete the drive. We used uh, three different emergency responses uh, events. They got one of these three at the end of each drive. And so those they're randomized. Um, one of the crazy things about randomization uh, that works out in our favor th this time is that uh, 
uh, as we were going through the data and we were expecting to kind of have a mixture of people at their at their two week visit uh, the randomization resulted in the first four people all winding up in the same condition uh, which threw me for a loop uh, but it worked out well uh, we had good data that we could compare across all of them with the same event uh, and so in this case what we've got is an emergency response uh, drivers going down the down a four-lane road, a uh, desk falls out of the back of the van. We'll, we'll see a video of this in a moment, uh, and the driver has to navigate around that. Um, and so these events were, these emergency response events were used as part of our electronic stability control work uh, designed to require uh, a, a big steering input. So we're going to see here the obstacle avoidance event. This is not a subject. This is one of our research assistants who's driving this for me. He didn't avoid it, uh, and so as you, as you see, the, there's a good period of time where they're driving behind the van before the door is open and a desk comes sliding out at them, requiring a, a steering, sharp steering input either to the right or the left to avoid that. Uh, the second of the emergency response was a right incursion. Uh, it's diagrammed here, uh, driving along a two-lane roadway, uh, pulling along uh, the incurring vehicle is masked by traffic parked along the roadway vehicle pulls onto the driver's lane they've got to steer left and then counter steer uh, while due to approaching oncoming traffic and we've got a video of this as well this one's a little shorter driving along and Watch that one more time. Again, they've been driving for about four minutes when this event happens. And the last of the emergency response events we had was a left incursion. Participants driving down the roadway in the ro with oncoming traffic. Uh, a vehicle pulls onto the roadway, forcing an oncoming vehicle to pull into the driver's lane, requiring the participant to veer to the right in order to avoid. And again, a relatively short video, and I'll play it through a second time. Fairly busy environment. Uh, they've seen some busy environments in this drive before. Uh, so uh, these events do come as a surprise to the driver. Uh, they're, each one's a little bit different, and uh, there's not a good way of predicting uh, what's going to happen. Uh, there's dense traffic and, and congestion on the side of the road in other places as well, in addition to just being uh, at the uh, event location. So uh, the results that we have uh, are going to look at um, what me – so this is what measures we, we looked at. Uh, and so we have normal driving compared to a healthy control group, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that before we go, before we move off of this slide. But we looked at uh, measures such as average speed relative to the speed limit uh, to try and look at whether or not drivers try to compensate for uh, their injury uh, or the recovery state by slowing down to give themselves more time to respond. Uh, standard deviation of lane position, uh, which is a is generally a good measure of impairment uh, when we're looking at drug driving, uh, drowsy driving, uh, alcohol impaired driving, those sort of things. And so we've looked at that as well. And then we've looked at two steering measures, uh, one of which is steering frequency, which is a measure indicating the cutoff frequency at which half the power is lost. So basically it's a matter of you know, how big a steering inputs are they, are they willing to make. And then steering reversal rate, so how frequently are they uh, putting in steering inputs greater than six degrees. Uh, oops, I was going to... so before we go on to the results, um, so what we did uh, as part of this work is to actually pull out from some of the data we've collected previously a normal healthy control group that we could compare against. And so because we've used this drive uh, 
in the urban, interstate, rural area so frequently, we have a lot of data that we've collected over the years from drivers who have driven it uh, for various studies, uh, some of which are drug studies. Um, and there's always in that group a, a group of people who either are a baseline control who aren't dosed or people who are on a placebo placebo visit uh, where they haven't, uh, don't have any active drugs in their system. And so what we did for the purpose of this research is to, is to use only the data from the mini-SIM. So this study was conducted on the mini-SIM. So we isolated only the data that came from the mini-SIM. And then what we did is we screened it for our, our age group, uh, making sure that we only have participants between 18 and 70 as part of that. And then we pulled out all of their, all the data from those data sets that was either baseline uh, or placebo uh, data. And so that allowed us to get a, a, a data set where we could get an idea of what the ver general variability of the of people's responses are. So looking at kind of what the min, the maxes are, what the spread is, and so we we were able to use that as a comparison. So when we when we talk about the the data we've got here for the normal driving, uh, we're able to look at the da data from our four people that have completed relative to uh, other drivers who have driven that same environment. Um, and the only major difference will be that in our drive they they started and they stopped uh, in other drives there's a continuous process through and so but because of the way we've chunked the data in terms of the, the start locations and, the, and the, the events uh, that's not as meaningful so so we're going to go on to the results and we're going to start with uh, the speed data and so what we note here is that these fracture patients uh, tended to drive slower uh, than did our control group patients. And so uh, as you look down, the ones that are highlighted in green on the left represent the, the events. And so you know, as we go back to the, the, the figures that I showed you earlier, we really focused on six events as part of this, which were the left turn, the urban environment, the urban curves, the turning off the ramp, the dark rural, which included the uh, uh, which included the tightening radius curve and then the transition, the gravel transition, which is that Y intersection. So what we're really looking at is places where, where there was going to be a, 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 some higher level of steering input required. So uh, again, we'll see this across all these variables, uh, but in general, we see a fairly significant shift from the control group to our fracture group in terms of how fast they drill. Uh, relative to the speed limit. And even with our, our nice small uh, N of four, uh, when we compare them to uh, this larger data set, uh, we can see that there's a, a, a significant enough shift that we're not, uh, that it doesn't look like these participants are, are part of that larger data set. So. So we looked at SDLP. Uh, we didn't see any difference in, in standard deviation of lane position. Um, I'm not sure that that's overly surprising. Uh, these patients are, uh, Lindsay can follow up on, how, on where they were at medicine-wise, uh, but they, you know, they're advised to not drive when they're, when they're taking their nar narcotic pain medicine. Um, and with the, with the events that we saw here for these patients, um, you know, there was a lot of variability uh, and that may reflect either not being on pain medicine at the time or being on a pain medicine that doesn't have as big of an impact on, on lane keeping. Uh, either way, uh, not a lot of, in, not, not, no observations of increased weaving at this point in time. Um, lower steering frequency, um, we did have to, we did drop one event off of the, this for steering frequency just based on uh, the turning maneuver, uh, but what we did see is that uh, those cutoffs as we talked about for steering frequency were lower across the board uh, for participants who were in the fracture group compared to people who were in the control group. And for steering reversals, uh, it's a little bit more mixed uh, of an answer. The only, the only significant difference we found was for the urban curves where we did see that the steering reversals were less for the fracture group than for the control group. Um, 
however, as we look at some of the other events, um, and I guess as we look at some of the other events, uh, I guess gravel has dropped off, which I'm going to apologize for. There was a seventh event that's that's dropped off on all of them. Um, but as we look at this, we're not seeing a, a across the board picture that says we've got a clear effect here where in terms of steering reversal rates. Um, and even if we look at the left turn event, we see that there's a slightly higher uh, median of the steering reversals for the fracture group compared to the control group. So um, there's mixed evidence here. A larger end will tell us more. So the fun and exciting part was all the crash events. Uh, those are always my favorite to watch. Um, but what we saw for these participants is that we saw of the four people who, who we completed at the time we did this analysis, that three of the four had uh, crashed. And so um, we tried to look at what might be associated with that. And we didn't see a lot of difference in terms of uh, maximum steering wheel angle or steering velocity. But when you got out, got out to, to looking at the third derivative, when you got looking at jerk rate, and so how quickly could they begin the uh, steering input? How, how forcefully would they do it? Uh, one, of the, one of the four people didn't respond at all in terms of a steering input. Uh, so basically steering didn't exceed plus or minus six degrees in response to the event. Uh, and so we treat that as a no response. Uh, and then for the other two who crashed, uh, they had jerk rates that were about two thirds of the level of the person who avoided the crash. Um, we don't have baseline data for this one uh, as we do with the, the normal driving. Uh, these events that we do have data for them are, were on the NADS one. And we've talked about looking at that, but with the difference in simulator platform, I'm, I'm a little leery about, uh, about reading too much into them. Uh, but we are, we may, we may do that in the future or we may collect a baseline sample of responses for this as well uh, further down the road to try and assess how these responses compare to what uh, normal healthies would do. So our preliminary results suggest that patients that are two weeks after having their distal radius fracture fixed with a volar plate seem to be able to maintain their lane position, but with overall lower speed and fewer steering inputs, and they don't seem to uniformly be able to avoid crashes that require quick steering inputs. Um, a brief note about where patients typically are two weeks after surgery. Uh, so when patients undergo surgery for this particular issue, um, we, the group of patients that we looked at were the ones who had what we call a volar plate or a plate that's on the palmar side of the wrist. Um, after surgery, they go into a non-removable splint for two weeks because that's about the amount of time it takes their incision to heal. At their two-week post-operative appointment, they, as long as the incision is adequately healed, we take x-rays, make sure everything looks good. They go into a removable splint at that time. Their sutures are removed, and they're allowed to take the splint off to do some range of motion of the wrist and to bathe. They're not allowed to basically put much of any force on the hand. We usually tell them they have about a five pound lifting restriction at that time. Um, the amount of stiffness they have is variable and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of those other factors and information that we're collecting on these patients later. But suffice to say, we, we wouldn't expect them necessarily to drive at the level of a normal healthy person without uh, an injury. So, the early conclusions we have should definitely be treated with caution, given the very small n and the preliminary nature of the work. Uh, as we mentioned, this is based on the first uh, visit for four patients uh, of a study that requires three visits for each patient and is actively uh, continuing to enroll. Uh, so obviously continued enrollment is needed to help provide further guidance on when patients can return to driving. Uh, in addition to the information presented here, as I mentioned, we do have the other two visits. We're also collecting a bunch of clinical information on these patients as well. So, for instance, which hand is it? Um, is it the hand that they're turning towards or the hand that they're turning away from on these avoidance tasks? Is it their dominant hand? Is it their non-dominant hand? And things like what range of motion did the patient exhibit at the clinic visit before their uh, driving study visit? 
uh, are they on pain medication? So most of our patients are taking pain medications uh, around two weeks postoperatively. Some are not, but the majority are still taking them at least occasionally at that point. Um, so are they still on pain medications and did they take them around the time of the driving test? Um, as uh, Tim mentioned, self-confidence and self-assessment surveys are also being collected. So how do these patients rate their performance compared to their actual performance? And does this rating change before and after they provide they um, perform the simulated driving task? Essentially, do these patients know when they're safe to return to driving? So with continued data collection and a larger number of patients, we do hope to be able to more definitively answer some of these questions and provide some more information to both physicians and patients on when they can return to driving after this particular injury. I think a couple things to note in here is, you know, one of the things that Lindsay and I were talking about is, you know, you know, why do we only have data from four subjects? Well, one should really try to collect this sort of data in a winter when there's ice um, and not in a winter where there's no ice. Uh, as we got ready for this, we we had an unusually nice winter here in Iowa, and uh, Lindsay, the, the university's taken of people who were suffering this injury was down significantly what from what it had been in previous years. And so yeah. uh, that really did a number on our on our end for this in terms of what we could collect last winter. Uh, we're, we've actually had more that were not in the winter than the, we're, that were in the winter right now in terms of who we've got enrolled. Uh, and so hopefully as we, we move into the future uh, and we collect some more data as we go through the winter months this year, uh, we'll we'll see a larger end that will allow us to explore some of this other data. It's just hard with an N of four to, to start looking at, you know, what what are the differences in confidence? You know, that survey data is really fairly meaningless at this point in time without knowing uh, more about the sample and how how each of the people relate to the overall sample of people who, who tend to have this type of surgery. And so uh, we're still actively trying to recruit that. And uh, I think to touch back on the pain medicine uh, observation. For those of you who were here a couple weeks ago when uh, Dr. Gaffney and I were talking about our, our study on narcotic pain medicine and anxiety medication, um, one of the things that was surprising in that was that for, you know, the narcotic did not, pain medicine did not have as much acute effect as one would have expected, particularly when compared to the anxiety medicine. And so, again, it's not the same pain medicine we had there, so there's, there's differences. But again, without a larger sample, it's hard to even delve into, you know, how how soon had they taken the pain medicine prior to their their visit, and so we don't have a recency measure there. And so I think there's a lot of things that are still up in the air that we're trying to trying to provide an answer for. Um, you know, I th and I think you know, people's assessment of whether or not they can drive uh, still remains to to be known. And I think as Lindsay and I prep for this, you know, I think. She's got some observations from over the over her interactions with people about whether or not they felt comfortable and, and how that changed based on having to respond to an emergency situation. Uh, so many times people focus on normal driving, uh, but as we all know in the in the vehicle safety side of things, you know crashes occur when rare things happen in combination. And so uh, one of the things we've got to be cautious of in looking at this is. Uh, we can't predict when somebody might encounter an event that requires an emergency response, so it may not be sufficient for us to observe that driving performance has returned back to baseline if there's still a decrement in the crash avoidance response uh, where steering is required. So those are some of the things we're still trying to delve into. Um, at this point in time, uh, we'll throw it back to Jacob uh, and open it up to any questions that people might have. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, yeah, it looks like Don Marshall has a question right away. What driving instructions were they given for the simulator drives, if any? Um, we'll start with that question. Or did, did, did she understand the participants reported here were uh, from a specific drive? Yeah, so uh, so the participants here all, we, we have four people who, who had completed data collection at the time we were going through this. All four of them had, for a crash avoidance, they had the uh, the desk falling out during week one. And so that was our, that was our, what we were looking at in terms of the crash response there. Um, 
And so that creates some, some interesting things in terms of the Lindsay's point about whether or not uh, they turn left or right. Um, that is the one event that allows them to choose which direction they want to steer. Uh, uh, both of them, both were, both were open as opportunities to them. Um, and so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, challenge that, we, that we'll work through. Uh, once we get the left and the right avoidance uh, in more representative numbers, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of how that plays out. Um, you know, the, back to the driving instructions, uh, that was, there weren't a lot of instructions that were given to them other than to drive, uh, quote, quote, as they normally would. The challenge there is these are people returning back to um, their turning back to driving in a simulator for, for the first time since they've had surgery. And so there's not really so much a normal uh, for them. Uh, you know, we got questions about, well, do I have to use my, my hand that's got the cast on it? Um, and, I, and I don't have the, the notes in front of me. We went back and forth on what to tell them. But the general message was do whatever you would do if you were driving in your vehicle at this point in time uh, and you know we saw people who would drive without one of the hands on the steering wheel uh, at least one of the, one of them didn't put their right hand on for their first visit uh, and so we, we do see a mixture of responses in there um, and you know there's gonna be a different comfort level for every person as they go through this in terms of what they're capable of doing and what they're willing to do based on where they're at in their recovery. Uh, and despite the fact that it's the same spot chronologically, that doesn't mean that mentally they're in the same spot in terms of their willingness to perform some of the driving tasks. For the, for the first driving simulator visit, they were in their removable splint for the driving uh, portion. Uh, and at the second and third, they were out of the splint. And basically, you know, we indicated these patients or included these patients in the study uh, based on the idea that the operative construct, so after we fix their distal radius, their healing and their stability would be strong enough to withstand anything that would reasonably happen uh, in the driving simulator. So from our perspective, clinically, they had no restrictions on what they could use the wrist for, um, other than what they would be limited uh, by pain from doing. So, you know, we really kind of wanted to mimic the whatever you're going to do in your car today is what we want you doing in the simulator today. And that is a good point uh, uh, that Lindsay brought up. It's one of the things we talked about again last Friday is, is trying to plot out some of these things as we get a larger sample size to look for. Do we see aborted uh, steering inputs in terms of the emergency response? Or do we see that as they're making a left turn? Do we see a more jagged response as they... Uh, maybe get to a spot where they're not as comfortable early in the, in the healing process and, and have to rely on using just one hand or, uh, or a different sort of approach to the response and giving up on a, on a steering response and avoidance. So are there any other questions from any of the other attendees? So it looks like there might be another question coming in. I saw someone typing, but maybe not. Um, oh, yes, there is. So another question from Don. Are there any changes you would make to this protocol given uh, given the pain and, and, and anxiety study? That's, that's a good question. You know, I think one of the things we saw is that uh, the narcotic pain medicine uh, didn't have as big of an acute effect. And for those of you who heard for that, one of the things we wanted to look at there was the more prolonged effect of people taking it over a period of time. Um, you know, it, it might have been, you know, it might be useful for some future larger study to, to have a, a pain medicine chart of when are you taking that? The struggle with that is that uh, for those of you who are trying to get a subject to do a log, uh, they're not as reliable as we would like. Uh, and so, um, you know, trying to get an idea of when they took the pain medicine and how frequently they were taking the pain medicine before this uh, would be useful. 
the struggle is doing that in some reliable method uh, where I can rely on the data being nominally val valid. And, you know, while I'm, I'm not super familiar with the pain and anxiety study portion of things, I think it's also um, important here to remember that these people are on a very tapered dose of narcotics. So they're typically opiate naive patients or people who certainly don't take a lot of chronic uh, medications of that sort who have an injury and then are typically on a fairly regular regimen of narcotics for a couple days with a, a long taper thereafter. Um, so it, it's going to change pretty significantly over that course, but usually by about two weeks, they're taking them sparingly, if at all, and by six weeks, they're off the narcotics because we are no longer providing them in clinic. So I think from the, that perspective, it may affect the first clinic visit, but likely is, you know, I can't say this with any confidence, but in our mind, it's not a huge factor in that. Yeah, I, I think I would concur, and I think as we talked about, the fact, even though the, the narcotic that you generally uh, prescribed is not the same one we tested, they're in the same general narcotic family, family. and so they're both op opioid uh, type narcotics, and so um, we didn't see much with an acute effect, and so if, if they're taking it sparingly at the end, there shouldn't be much of an effect, but, you know, again, that goes back to the, if they, for whatever reason, took it, you know, between the time that they left the clinic here to come over and when they got over there to drive, there may be, there's more likely to be an effect. And so we just don't know at this point in time. Um, it would be nice to know. It would but. be nice to know, yeah. And what I can say, too, is, you know, as much as as physicians, we really don't have a solid answer for these people on when they can return to driving, the speech that I usually give them after surgery is, is something like this, which is that what I can tell you is that you probably shouldn't be driving when you're on narcotic pain medications. Um, so I would recommend against that because I think it's not a safe thing for you to do. So you can't be taking your narcotic medications. And then secondly, um, you know, there are people out there with one hand who can drive and can drive well, but they took their license test that way. They've been evaluated that way. They're used to that. I can't tell you if and when you can safely drive with your one hand immobilized or in pain. Um, but we do typically tell them not to drive while they are on the narcotic pain medication. Okay, so we'll open it up for any more questions here at the end. Um, I will say we, we do have some upcoming webinars here now that the semester started. It looks like our next one will be September 26th, which is, uh, it'll be about driving simulators for virtual road safety audits. Um, so keep an eye out for announcements and registration for our future webinars. This webinar today that Tim and Lindsay presented We'll get this up online and sent out to the registrants here within one to two days, so keep an eye out for that. Um, I think that's everything we have, so thank you again, Tim and Lindsay, for the presentation. Um, really interesting work you're doing. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you.